women in Latin America gained the right to vote much later than in the United States and most European countries. Suffrage was expanded to women in Ecuador, Uruguay, Brazil, and Cuba during the late 1920s or early 30s. But it would take decades longer in other parts of the region, and women in Paraguay would not gain the right to vote until the 1960s. The two countries that have been the focus of our last several videos are on opposite ends of this timeline. Reformists in Uruguay narrowly failed to get women's suffrage enshrined in Uruguay's 1918 constitution, but this constitution does specify that suffrage could be extended to women through a vote in Congress. Uruguayan women began voting in local elections in 1927, and they gained the right to vote in all elections in 1932, which goes into effect in 1938. In Chile, this process takes much longer. Although women in Chile gained the right to vote in municipal elections starting in 1935, it was not until 1952 that women began voting in national elections. The women's suffrage movement and the liberal feminist movement more broadly provides a good case study for examining the capacity of reformist elite parties like the Chilean radicals and Uruguayan bajistas, to incorporate new social demands onto their political agendas. As we are going to see in this video, these parties' differing positions on women's suffrage was one of the main reasons why women's suffrage happens relatively quickly in Uruguay, while it takes much longer in Chile. José Baixi Ordóñez was one of the earliest proponents of women's suffrage within Uruguay's political establishment, though he ultimately postponed this issue so that he could focus on the economic reforms of his second presidency. When his second presidency ends in 1915, the extension of suffrage to women was one of several reforms that remained unaccomplished. It is likely that the Constitution of 1918 would have granted women suffrage if the Bajistas had won the Constituent Assembly election of 1916. However, as you may recall, that election was won by Bajistas' right-wing opponents, and they voted down the proposals for women's suffrage in the Constitutional Assembly. As Uruguay settles into its new democracy, and the Bajistas focused their attention on protecting the social and economic reforms that they had already accomplished, women's suffrage risks being ignored once again. However, an organization called the Alliance for Uruguayan Women continues to agitate on this issue throughout the 1920s. The most prominent leader of this movement was the Socialist Party member and physician, Paulina Luisi. But the alliance also contains several members of the Bajista movement, including the lawyer Isabel Pinto de Vidal, who would later become one of the first congresswomen in Latin America. This alliance recognized that the Bajista movement and the progressive sectors of the National Party were on their side in principle. And the real challenge was to make women's suffrage a salient enough issue that these male politicians would be willing to pass a law to address it at a time when there were a thousand other economic and social issues occupying Uruguay's political agenda. This map was part of the campaign material that the Alliance for Uruguayan Women published, and it does a good job of illustrating their political and rhetorical strategy. The map shows the countries where women already had the right to vote in white, while it shows the countries where women did not yet have suffrage in black. Some people might look at this map and conclude, all right, Uruguay is perfectly in line with the rest of Latin America, so what is the problem? But remember that the Bajistas do not want Uruguay to be just another Latin American country. They want Uruguay to be the leading example of progressive politics for the rest of the world to follow. And from their standpoint, it is a true embarrassment that Uruguayan women should be denied the right to vote 
at a time when women's suffrage is already a thing in Eastern Europe, South Africa, and India. So this map is a clever way to shame the Bajista political establishment into caring enough about this issue to actually spend some political capital on solving it. As the Bajistas gained more ground in Congress during the late 1920s, women's suffrage finally starts to pick up some momentum in Uruguay's political system. In 1927, Uruguay's electoral court issues a ruling that gives women the right to vote in a local referendum in the tiny town of Cerro Chato, marking the first time that women voted in an election in South America. Five years later, in 1932, an alliance between the Bajistas and reformist Blancos in Congress passes a law that extends suffrage to women in all national elections going forward. The implementation of this law is delayed for several years due to the breakdown of Uruguay's first democracy in 1933. But even Uruguay's reactionary dictatorship reaffirms women's right to vote when it rewrites the constitution in 1934. And when Uruguay gets around to holding regular elections again in 1938, women finally participate for the first time on a nationwide basis. The failure to get women's suffrage codified in the 1918 constitution was certainly a missed opportunity. But the Uruguayan women's suffrage movement was able to find enough support in both of the country's traditional parties that women's suffrage gets passed relatively early by Latin American standards. The women's suffrage movement in Chile faces a much tougher battle, and the radical party was one of the biggest obstacles standing in its way. This may be somewhat counterintuitive given that the Chilean Radical Party was on the progressive edge of most other social issues. But women's suffrage was a notable exception where the Radical Party takes a relatively conservative position. This is almost entirely due to the party's political self-interest rather than its ideology. The Radical Party opposes women's suffrage because it does not think that it would ever be able to win an election in which women had the right to vote. The Radical Party's weakness among women was rooted in the way that the party had developed historically. We saw earlier how the radical social network of the 19th century had been bound together through a series of civil society organizations such as the Volunteer Firemen Corps and the Freemasons. All these organizations were explicitly closed to women, and as a result, women were largely excluded from the Radical Party's social networks to an even greater degree than Chile's other traditional parties. Some of the Radical Assemblies were opened to women by the early 20th century, but these assemblies were often a less than welcoming environment for women who were participating in party politics for the first time. Even after women started joining the assemblies, the debates in the radical assembly tended to be dominated by men. And even as late as the 1960s, some women within the radical party reported having a difficult time getting their voices heard on the assembly floor. By the 1920s, the radical leadership recognizes that their party has less support among women than just about any other major party in Chile. And the radicals fear that if suffrage is extended to women now, then most of the women's vote is going to go to their arch enemy, the conservative party. As a result, the liberal feminist movement in Chile is hindered by its lack of a reliable partisan ally that is willing to support all of its goals. The only thing that every party can agree on is that women should have access to education. But on every other issue, the feminist movement ends up being blocked by one or more of Chile's three main parties. The conservatives are happy to support women's suffrage out of electoral self-interest, but the radical and liberal parties oppose women's suffrage for these exact same reasons. On the other hand, the radical and liberal parties are willing to support other goals of the liberal feminist movement, such as legal equality, but the conservative party opposes all of these things. <laughs> 
Unfortunately for the feminist movement, this is a period of Chilean political history when you really need the support of all three of these parties in order to get anything passed through Congress. So most of the feminist movement's goals stall, and only women's education advances through Congress. This creates an explosive and ultimately unsustainable situation where women in early 20th century Chile are very highly educated by the standards of the day, but they have very few political or even legal rights whatsoever. The women's equality movement is much larger than any one person, but for narrative purposes, I am going to focus now on how one particular radical party activist, Amanda Labarca, worked to turn her party around on these issues. Labarca is one of the first Chilean feminist activists to recognize that a big factor that is holding back Chilean women's equality in the political realm is their utter lack of legal rights in the private realm. The Chilean legal code at this time is one of the most conservative legal codes on gender issues in all of Latin America. Under the 1855 code, a married woman in Chile was completely legally and financially dependent upon her husband. She was legally obligated to obey her husband and reside with him wherever he chose to live, and she was not allowed to testify as a witness in a court of law. A husband even had a legal right to ask a judge to issue an injunction prohibiting his wife from working outside of the household. Amanda Labarca looks at this legal code and she realizes that as long as these laws remain in place, it does not really make sense to pursue women's suffrage in Chile. If women gain the right to vote prior to gaining full legal equality and independence from their husbands, then husbands are simply going to end up coercing their wives to vote against their self-interests. And this will make it even harder to get women's legal equality passed in the future. However, La Barca also recognizes that it is problematic to pursue legal equality without also achieving some political equality. Because if women cannot vote, then they are not a political constituency that any party is going to care about. And the existing parties will see no reason to pursue women's legal equality in the first place. And so Amanda Labarca and the Chilean liberal feminist movement more broadly decide that suffrage and legal equality need to be pursued at the same time. Women's suffrage must be phased in slowly while early reforms to the Chilean legal code get passed. This will enable women to become a political constituency in their own right while also freeing them from domination by their husbands. This, in turn, would give the feminist movement the political clout that it needs to push for full legal equality. And once that happens, Chile would finally be ready for women's suffrage in national elections. A challenge that Amanda Labarca faces is that she needs to convince her predominantly male radical party to make women's equality a priority. But one thing that Labarca has in her favor is that she is very much part of the intelligentsia that holds a disproportionate amount of influence in radical party politics at this time. The radical party of the early 20th century cares a lot about academic credentials. And Abanda Labarca has the credentials that enable her to get taken seriously by the rest of her party. She goes to her local radical assembly in Santiago and she starts presenting some of her proposals for women's legal equality. And she is able to convince the Santiago assembly to endorse some of these legal reforms. However, these proposals did not really go anywhere because none of the party's politicians in Congress are willing to take them up. And so Labarca eventually decides that she needs to organize outside of her own party as well. Her husband happens to be an editor for one of the most popular magazines in Chile at the time, and she uses his publishing connections to get a platform for herself first as a columnist in the magazine Familia, and later on as an editor of her own magazine, Acción Femenina, 
or women's action. She also continues to publish books on women's equality. She leverages her visibility in this public discourse to build a political movement around women's issues with a particular emphasis on legal equality. She recruits members into this movement largely from the radical party's own networks, the wives and daughters of radical assembly activists and politicians. But because Labarca's movement is technically independent from the radical party, it is not beholden to the party's agenda, and it is able to form tactical alliances with other ideologically liberal parties as well. In the early 1920s, La Barca approaches two politicians from outside her party, the liberal congressman Jose Massa and the democratic liberal Roberto Sanchez. And these congressmen agree to present a bill to Congress that would reform Chile's civil code to eliminate the gender biases in the law. Unfortunately, Chile's Congress is hopelessly gridlocked in the early 1920s, so this reform bill quickly stalls. However, that turns out not to matter because the government gets overthrown anyway in 1924. And one of the politicians who decides to cooperate with the new military government is none other than Jose Massa, who gets appointed Minister of Justice under one of the military juntas. In that capacity, Massa issues an emergency decree that pushes through at least part of Amanda Labarca's earlier legal reform proposal. In particular, it gives married women greater control over their property and the estates of their late husbands, and it also enables women to serve as witnesses in courts of law. This decree is a major advance for women's equality in Chile, but it is a sad state of affairs that it took a military dictatorship to get it done. After Chilean democracy restabilizes in 1932, Amanda Labarca helps found a new organization called the National Committee for Women's Rights, which successfully persuades the new liberal-led coalition government to pass a law that grants women suffrage in municipal elections beginning in 1935. In order to limit the likelihood that men would be able to influence the way that their wives and daughters voted, this law also establishes a system of separate polling places for women. The hope is that if women are voting at female-only polling places, then they will be more likely to vote their own interests. However, an unintended consequence of this reform is that it confirms the radical party's fear that it is incapable of winning the woman's vote. The separate polling places for women and men make it very easy to calculate how voters from each gender are voting in this 1935 municipal election. And the results show that at a time when the radical party was winning the votes of around 20% of men, they are able to obtain the support of only 12% of women voters. Instead, nearly half of the women's vote ends up going to the radical's historic enemy, the conservative party. The direction of this gender gap in voting makes much of the radical party's leadership even more squeamish about supporting full woman suffrage over the short term, because if this same pattern holds at the national level, then full woman suffrage would only benefit the conservatives. Meanwhile, the women's equality movement in Chile has become much larger and better organized by the mid-1930s. Around the time of the 1935 municipal election, a new women's equality organization is founded called the Movement for the Emancipation of Chilean Women, or MEMSH. Although Amanda Labarca is not directly involved in the MEMSH, she is a friend and former mentor of several of its leading organizers, including its founder, Elena Cafarena. In contrast to earlier women's equality organizations in Chile, the MEMSH is much more of a mass organization. And while it contains members from all of Chile's left-wing and reformist parties, most of its leaders have ties to the Communist Party, including Cafarera. This is important because around this same time, the communists are busy joining together with the radicals, the socialists, and other left-of-center parties to form Chile's popular front. <laughs> 
The Memsh becomes a vocal supporter of the Popular Front as well, and Memsh activists help campaign for the Popular Front's 1938 presidential candidate, Pedro Aguirre Cerda, who is a member of the Radical Party and a close personal friend of Amanda Labarca. Both Labarca and the Mensch are optimistic that Aguirre Cerda's election in 1938 would open the door for further reforms in support of women's equality. And President Aguirre Cerda even announces his intention to pursue a constitutional reform that would greatly strengthen the political and legal rights of Chilean women. However, Aguirre Cerda dies in office before this can get underway, and women's equality in Chile stalls once again. In the meantime, women activists within the Radical Party had begun organizing a women's wing of the party called the Radical Women's Assembly. Although women are still allowed to join the main radical assemblies, this radical women's assembly is an exclusively female space of party activism that is designed to be a more welcoming environment for women compared to the primary assemblies. The foundation of the radical women's assembly strengthens the clout of women within radical party politics, and it also helps the party close its traditional gender gap by recruiting more women into radical party politics. While the women's vote for the radical party continues to lag behind the men's vote in all of the municipal elections throughout the 1930s and 40s, this gap does narrow over time, falling from 8 percentage points in 1935 to less than 4 percentage points in 1947. This helps reassure the radical party leadership that granting women the vote would no longer be as electorally catastrophic for the party as it might have been in the 1930s, because women are now voting for the radical party at a similar rate as men. Women's suffrage starts to gain momentum again in the late 1940s during the presidency of the radical politician Gabriel González Videla. And in 1949, the Congress finally passes a law that extends suffrage to women in national elections while preserving the gender-based segregation of the voter registry and polling places. This expansion of suffrage comes into effect for the first time in a 1951 special election to fill a vacant seat in Congress. And this 1951 election is won by the radical party activist Ines Enriquez Froden, who had helped lead the effort to establish a woman's wing within the Radical Party a decade earlier, and who has now become the first woman elected to the Chilean Congress. <laughs> 